Hello and welcome to day two of our 2023 Pacific Agriculture Knowledge Management Fair. Elia here with you again and together with Ian, we'll be taking you through today's final program. Uh, before we get into it, we'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists. Uh, panelists, please give us a wave as we your name. Um, so firstly, Koming Wei uh, will deliver an informative keynote address on the digital era of um, farmer resources. She is unfortunately unable to join us this morning, but has made arrangements uh, for an alternative method that's in line with the theme of her address. Following the keynote address, we'll have a transition to a slideshow of submitted resources before a farmer training guide showcase featuring Pacific Farmer Organizations by Angela Birch and um, Reni Vangi Estate by Karen Mills. Another transition to a slideshow of submitted resources follows before a case showcase on lessons learned and impact stories featuring Island Business by Samantha Magic, who will be joining us later this morning and Island Food Community of Pompeii by Adolino Lorenz. To conclude, we have an exciting video lined up showcasing the winners of our competition, uh, format highlights and judging criteria, as well as some of the insights on the competition. Once again, welcome to the final day of our Pacific Agriculture Knowledge Management Fair, and we hope you have an enjoyable experience. Um, Without further ado, we now welcome Father Isaiah of Tutu Rural Training Center for the opening prayer. Let us uh, bow our heads and pray for God's blessing for this morning's meetings. Let us pray. In the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, we thank you for the gift of uh, this day. We thank you for the gift of our person. We thank you for gracing us with our call to be good stewards of creation, with love of the ecology, and uh, how we did it with uh, today's views. We ask you to give us the graces that we need, especially in this meeting, the deliberations, and also our conversations that uh, uh, what we discuss in this meeting is for the betterment of the, the community and also in where we engage in. Uh, continue to give us your blessings and uh, our way forward in this meeting. We ask you to grant this prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Um, that was great to hear. Uh, now I'm going to share the presentation we have from Ming Wei. It is a video presentation. One second while I share it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're happy to start out the day with a keynote address and words of wisdom, welcoming remarks from Ko Ming Wei, the founder of Center for Getting Things Started. I wanna pass it over to Ming Wei to introduce herself. Well, thank you very much, Ian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings to all the farmers and friends around the islands. As Ian said, um, some of you may know me from our interactions with Breadfruit People. I had the wonderful opportunity to support Breadfruit People in co-developing their latest strategic plan. And I think I've also met some of you during the Global Breadfruit Summit we had um, on Honolulu. So most of my work um, is with teachers in agriculture. So I'm used to actually teaching teachers and creating materials for teachers around agriculture and how to teach agriculture. And so the work with farmers is similar, yeah? And so just wanted to share just a few words of wisdom. All of this you already know. We are all experts in this together, but I just thought I'll make it simple and succinct um, on how we can co-create as a community impactful resources that our fellow farmers can use, our educators can use, our youth can use, so that we all uh, strive towards a sustainable future together and strengthening our food systems and our economic systems through the wonderful world of food. 
All right, so Ian, if it's okay, I'll just share my screen. And I have just a few uh, um, resources to, to show as examples uh, for, now if I go into the slideshow. All right, hopefully this all works. So I have a few resources to share with you as exemplars of impactful resources. And these are the resources actually that are part of your knowledge management fair. So it's very, very exciting to be able to, to feature um, these resources. So just four things to remember when we create resources together is the resources need to reflect our values or our guiding principles. So I'm just gonna say values-based and it has to be relatable. The resources also have to be applicable and accessible. And I'll go into these details um, one at a time. So again, the resources need to reflect our values, or our guiding principles. It's very clear what the organization stands for. And so instead of me talking about it, I'm gonna play this clip for 30 seconds. And then I'm gonna see if Ian can answer the question of what he thinks the values and guiding principles are. Ready, everyone? This community in Fiji is practicing the art of Sole Solevaki. This Fijian custom is a traditional concept of working together for the common good without expecting an individual reward. Children nowadays, they don't know anything about Sole Solevaki or working together. Because uh, mostly they are teached or they are grown up today with a method of uh, knowing themselves to work by themselves. So Lisalavaki is uh, like volunteers from other farmers. So we can, uh, here in uh, Marintawa, we have our cluster, we have about uh, 25 farmers. Labor intensive. Okay, hey, Ian, what do you think? Just that short 30 seconds. What Great. Could yeah, so without knowing anything about Rise Beyond the Reef, just from that introduction, you see uh, it's community farming, it's working together. Um, and already you see youth in agriculture, um, elders in agriculture, it had that mix. And so had a lot of points right at the beginning. Yeah, and then the whole concept of Suli Sulivaki, of working together. I really appreciated what the young man said, um, that, that this actual value is no long, it, is not very often taught to young people. He even pointed out the negative aspect, um, which is them working as individuals. So it's very clear, right? Um, beyond the Reef, like you, I did not know much about the group, but just watching that short clip, I could understand those were the, the, the values of that community. So again, you know, your resources, your, your, your values need to be right up front. Ian, you had a question for me too. Yeah, so we've seen, I know you had a recent publication where you actually had all the pictures, illustrations up at the very front. So you had all the body in a training guide, I think it's for teachers um, from school, um, gardens to school. And basically you had all those illustrations up front. Um, what was that about? How would you recommend that? Yeah, so that actually is the perfect segue into the second principle of being relatable. So I will skip to that third point about people, farmers can see themselves in that resource, right? And so by putting up all the illustrations up front, th this uh, resource, just to be very clear, was for teachers who teach children of kindergarten through sixth grade. So we're talking with about communicating with our youngest learners in our communities. So by putting all the eye-catching materials up front in the resource, the teachers didn't have to look for it all hidden somewhere in the resource, number one. Number two, again, they could see themselves up front. The children could see themselves as part of the resource. The teachers could see themselves in the resource. And also what really is fun about putting the materials all up front is that it's up to the teacher how he or she may want to use it. If you put that resource within one particular topic, people might feel, oh, it's only, it's only relatable to this one thing. They may feel constrained. But by putting it all up there, they can change it up and use it for other things. 
Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And it really fits this 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 element of it has to be relatable. Yeah. The, you know, the pictures and, and this is again an example from um one of the publications that was created, I, be, I believe, by by um Pifon. And you look at the pictures, you already know this is a sense of place, right? We are looking at uh at breadfruit, uh a plant that we islanders are familiar with. Some of you probably even might know the young people in the photos. So immediately we have the sense of place. And the topic is something that relates to us. So the topic of this particular one is breadfruit. And being island people, this is a place that it's topic. So um, relatable is another element of consideration for impactful resources. The third element um, is that it needs to be applicable. So whatever your resource is, it has to be super practical. And I really strongly believe it needs to include traditional and cultural knowledge, and it has to be research-based. So Ian, I know this is quite small, and, and I hope the audience can see it. But if you just quickly even look at this one short paragraph, um, they have put so much thought into this. So first, of course, you've got this young farmer with his kava plants or over there. I, I It's called, I don't want to call it the wrong thing, but I call it ava or kava. And then they say right here, they explain a, 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 a cropping system. And it says this cropping system based on traditional knowledge will be the one you will utilize in adopting. But then they say, oh, here's more research. Go to this agroforestry.org uh, publication, Agroforestry Guides. This is the research done. Some of you know our wonderful Dr. Craig Elevich. And then furthermore, there are other discussions that include um, being practical. If you click on these little presentations, I got to see some of them. Very practical advice. So again, how do you apply the advice needs to be practical, includes traditional and cultural knowledge, and also be vetted and research-based. Last but not least, the, the, um, the fourth point is, of course, accessibility. Now, as Pacific Islanders, or just Islanders around the whole globe, this is uh, the language is uh, something we struggle with because we have so many. So I know many of us are looking for ways to either translate resources or already co-create uh, resources in, the, in, in different languages with our farmers and with our teachers. So because for many of us, English is not our first language and yet is the language of choice for our resources, I encourage us to write in a simple and yet welcoming style. Um, and of course, we need to have uh, visuals and it's searchable. Oh, look at this. When I cut, when I made a screenshot, it blocked it a little bit. But look at how, how, how this resource opens. I love this. So it's very catchy. Yeah. Look at all the pictures and smiling people. Gardens with a key. Pandemic prompts Kiho Gardens in Rarotonga. And, and the style is very, very welcoming. If you happen to drive past some homes in Rarotonga these days, don't be alarmed if you begin to wonder whether some of the backyard gardens you see are locked up with keys. Why would you think that? And it goes on. So already very catchy, very simple. Uh, just, just a way to draw you in with the visuals and with the, with the language that to me is very welcoming. So again, when we're creating resources, let's make sure it's, it's accessible for the many, many diverse cultures and languages that we all can celebrate uh, amongst our islanders. So here's another example of a resource that is very accessible. Just take a look at this page that I uh, cut from a resource on how to use wax and beekeeping. Ian, just, just again, you don't really know this resource very well. You're just looking at this one page out of context. How do you think this is an, an accessible resource? So the pictures clearly show you the products. 
Um, and so that's one thing you very quickly see, um, you know, these are value added honey uh, bee products basically. So made out of beeswax, um, these are what they look like. And instantly, you know, behind this um, resource, you'd imagine it's how to make it, maybe how to market um, this beeswax. And so when you see these products, my mind's already processing that, you know, these being for sale, these being products they're selling, it's clearly value added just from beeswax, from honey. Yeah, I, I hope many of you will actually get to read the whole uh, resource book. Uh, to me, while that book may not have been as glamorous or colorful as some of the other books that were part of the fair, I found this uh, resource to be the most usable. I thought it was very simple. There were very clear steps, one, two, three, four, next page. And so I just want to um, commend the, the, the folks who, who created this resource knowing that it had to be accessible. One of the last things that if if our resource, uh, if we can think about this as we create accessible resource is to make our resources searchable. So the next example I'm going to share with you is um, not particularly for farmers, it's for educators. And yet I think it can have some valuable lessons for us as we create resources. So Ian, can you see my screen? Okay, we're yep. having... Okay, so our Ulu Education Toolkit, um, Ulu, breadfruit, me, my, mas, u, utu, uru. Um, this was co-created by teachers, with teachers, for teachers, in partnership with the Hawaii Ulu Cooperative, who is a, a member right now of uh, the Pacific Islands Farmer Organization Network, and with the Hawaii Farm to School Hui. A great, who we means group. So our group represents the whole uh, set of islands. And what's really fun about this resource, it's that it's searchable. So under learner level, we can click that we would like something that's made uh, from preschool to second grade or third to fifth grade, so on and so forth. So let's just already start doing it. Let's say we want to look for something for three to five targeted to that age. And you already saw that the, the, the resources changed, yeah? So those that were for older students got filtered off. Then we want to look for content standards. Do we want to have fine arts, career technology, and education, language arts, math, social studies, science, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So let's just do something maybe with language arts. And again, it it, it reduced it. Um, there's a resource type. Do we want it to be a supplementary resource? So that could be like a brochure or poster. Are we looking for a recipe? Are we looking for a video? Um, so on and so forth, okay? So let's look for a, a, a lesson and a, a, oh, I don't know which one, so many yummy ones. <laughs> let's look for a lesson and a unit plan. Um, then also we have um, these themes for our Hawaii school garden curriculum. And then we can even look for the resource by the person who created it. So some of you may know, have heard of maybe Dr. Noah Lincoln, that he is quite a breadfruit researcher, or some of you know the work of the Breadfruit Institute. So you can see as you go through the filters that they have narrowed down all these different resources that are applicable for grades three to five, connect to language arts, and it's a lesson or unit plan. And every time you change a filter, it again closes in on the res uh, resources. So now we know there are no videos for three to five, but there are lots of lesson plans and there are no recipes. So again, making your resources searchable, something like this also helps us figure out the gaps. We know what we do have, and we just found out using this, what we might not have 
And that can then help us think about other resource that we might need to create. So again, just very brief little um, talk story with you on some four things to consider when creating impactful resources, making sure that you have it clear what your values and your guiding principles are, making sure that your resources are relatable, maybe even having some things up front, getting all the eye-catchy things up front so people can say, ah, at once I can do this. Uh, it's applicable, it's practical, it honors traditional and ecological, uh, traditional ecological knowledge in our cultures. And uh, last but not least, it's accessible. So thank you all very much for your kind attention and time. I look forward to um, the rest of the Knowledge Management Fair and really enjoyed looking through all these wonderful resources and useful resources that were part of the fair. Mahalo nui loa and have a nice day. Malama pono. Thank you so much, Mingwe. Well, it was great to hear from Mingwe. Uh, I think it's a good example of what we're after is how can the resources we produce be the most usable as well as reach the most farmers. And so actionable steps, uh, clearly outlined, um, lots of pictures. These are just a couple examples she touched on. Um, and so excited to highlight our um, submissions we had for our farmer training guides. And so we had over 55 farmer training guides um, submitted as part of the CAN Fair. Um, from all over. Here are some examples. Uh, Fiji export procedures for selected crops. We had the Breadfruit Institute submit breadfruit resources on processing and production. We had getting started in agroforestry from Hawaii from Craig Elevich. Uh, bee products and Fiji beekeeping manuals. Nishi Trading submitted a couple resources on training manuals for uh, post harvest processing for pumpkin, um, for pineapple. Uh, we had another guide on disease control, seed production. And so we had many farmer uh, training guides submitted, all amazing resources, excited to share those with everyone. Next, we're gonna have Angela Birch, who's in charge of knowledge management for PFON, share on some of our resources that are available and the process on curating, producing, and sharing uh, this information to as many farmers as possible. Thank you, Ian. I'm just going to share my screen. Pacific greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Grateful for this opportunity to share on what we do as a regional secretariat in the area of um, knowledge management, managing the resources, um, some that have already been shared. Um, across the network. Uh, Pacific Farmer Organizations, or PIFON as we're more commonly referred to, uh, was informally set up in 2008 as, a, as an avenue for sharing information amongst farmers from Pacific Island countries. And as our chairman, Minoru Nishi, uh, shared yesterday or stated, it all began with pushing pen and paper at face-to-face -face meetings. Then in 2013, uh, we became a formal entity with six participating member countries, and now 10 years on, you can see from the map before you, we have 30 farmer organizations across 12 countries with a reach of more than 95,000 farmers. Our members work across six key thematic areas, namely sustainable agriculture, youth in agriculture, women in agriculture, uh, policy advocacy, capacity building, and women in agri, uh, sorry, and um, breadfruit, uh, a climate resilient crop. And we know the amazing work that they do. And so as an information network, over the years, our knowledge management processes have um, progressed so that we can be able to support our stakeholders with effective decision-making, capacity building, and policy advocacy. And given the breadth and the depth of the work that our members do with their farmers, we use different approaches to, to manage the resources that they share with us and, and disseminate what we, what we can through um, various platforms. So um, some of the products that we produce from a regional level to support our members and other stakeholders um, 
fall into publications, videos, and um, as you saw yesterday, uh, through different social media platforms, as well as our website. So we'll begin with publications. So from the various projects that we've engaged in, um, we have been able to produce uh, some of the publications that you see on the screen before you. So if I can start with farmers having their say, this was produced under a project called MTCP2 prior to COVID. And it's a step-by-step -step guide that provides our members um, with an idea of how to affect policy. So whether it's a new policy that they're trying to have introduced, or if it's a, if it's a policy that they'd like to see change, this Farmers Having Their Say is a printed publication and it's also available on our website, but it does help them to, to work through different steps to affect that policy. In the area of capacity building, we've um, published and printed uh, again, also available on our website, the Agricultural Value Chain Guide for the Pacific Islands. And this is accompanied by a um, larger flip chart, which our members can use in training to, um, to, to when, they're, when they're looking at value chain um, awareness and analysis. So um, from a regional level, we, we work with our members so that they can use these sorts of guides to assist in their, in their capacity building efforts. Another, pub, sorry, another publication that we have um, printed and it's also available in soft copy is the Breadfruit Manual. I touched briefly on this as this is one of the key thematic areas in climate resilience. So um, it works to um, provide information on, on growing and marketing breadfruit, finding that important market access and um, Ming Wei touched briefly on this in her presentation. Uh, then we also manage um, all the data that comes in from our members, uh, the impact stories that they share. Yesterday, we heard from Mordi on um, some of the case studies that they've uh, undertaken. So it's those sorts, uh, sorts of information that we then work directly with our farm organizations to produce impact stories. And the one that you see on the screen before you was one that we worked on with Ireland's Business. And it just pulls stories from across our different member countries, uh, lessons learned, and, um, and that's uh, available in hard copy as well as on our website. Given the um, impact of climate change in our region, the severity of it all, uh, there were modules produced, an eight module, um, uh, a series of eight modules, sorry, that, sorry, that was produced last year. And um, it's something that farmers can pick up and, and read through or and, and mostly holds pictures, but this is something that we have available on our website and farmers have access to this. And it was done in collaboration with Australian Aid. Uh, and there's eight modules. And if you, can, if you read through it, it looks at impact of climate change. It looks at unsustainable and sustainable crop, crop, cropping practices, sustainable agroforestry cropping systems, and, and there's a whole series right to the economics of, of whether to engage in a particular crop. So these, these publications are available on our website for farmers and, and for anyone interested in, in looking at um, climate change mitigation and what can be done. In addition to what we have available by way, by way of our regional publications, we also work with our farmer organizations. Uh, Ian shared a whole lot of manuals that they had uh, submitted. Um, and so we also have this available on the website. Uh, with Tonga, we produced a vanilla manual. Uh, and there are a number of, of um, publications such as these that we share across the network. In regard to videos, this is another area that we, we work with our um, members. So for regional and international representation, we, pr we produce videos from the information shared by our members. So for a SIDS forum that was held in, um, about a year ago, uh, that it was focused on digital tools. So we produced a video in this area so that it could be presented at this global forum. Um, and then, there was a global youth conference and one of our members, Tutu Rural Training Center, um, there was a video that was produced in conjunction with Green Pillars that Shania shared during her presentation yesterday. And um, the video produced there was then 
adapted for this global youth forum that was held two years ago. And this is also available um, on our YouTube uh, account. For natural re national representation, um, what we did at the time of COVID, it was very difficult to travel. So um, Green Pillars here in Fiji was produced by Fiji TV. And we worked across all our members here in Fiji and they shared on best practices, the work that they do. And this is available too on our YouTube channel. And uh, at a recent event that we held uh, with our members, it was uh, an opportunity for us to do a series of videos on cultural perspectives from their um, from their from their region. So this series is also available on our YouTube website. And then at the community level, uh, a number of our farmer organizations have produced videos so that they can disseminate in the community. And we've actually put this um, on our YouTube channel. Uh, Bulla Agro did a series on nursery management. We had Friend do um, an eight video series on growing leafy vegetables. They provided recipes for, for, for cooking those vegetables. There was one on gluten-free flour. Um, they worked with uh, breadfruit flour and also cassava flour, and they produced uh, videos to help show the communities on how best to, um, to prepare um, uh, uh, menu items from these uh, resources, from, from these ingredients. So this is the sort of thing that we have available as well um, on, our, on our respective platforms. The, the website holds uh, an area totally dedicated to resources, whether it's publications or videos, and that's at pacificfarmers.com. But one that uh, Mingwei also mentioned is breadfruitpeople.com. So uh, it's a virtual community that um, looks to everything on breadfruit and um, anything that you need, you can access here on, in the area of breadfruit. And for more information, you can look to our website, YouTube, but we also do a lot of work on Facebook. Our communications team is very busy updating our Facebook page. We track the work of our members and um, we share information that they share on our Facebook page as we do with Instagram and Twitter. And that in a nutshell is a brief overview of what we do to help manage the, the huge amount of resources that, um, that our members share with us. Uh, it is a work in progress, but uh, I thank you for your time. And if you do need additional information, um, please do uh, look at our website as that holds the bulk of what we have in the area of knowledge management. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angela. Thanks for covering the process of when we have these farmer training guides, you know, also where can they be launched? Where can they be shared? Um, that's half the impact of producing the guide and then getting it out. Um, it's really great to hear you cover that. I'm now happy to have Karen Mills um, present. She's the head of Munrinikagi Estate and a huge contributor to Fiji beekeeping and has a great example of a production guide with lots of pictures on how to be useful with your bees. So I'd like to pass it to you. Thank you. Um, before I, I start sharing my presentation, I just wanted to uh, give a little bit of background on how these guides were developed. Um, before COVID, uh, there were uh, Fiji beekeepers contracted a small NGO to offer some uh, value added training um, uh, workshops for beekeepers in Fiji. Unfortunately, during COVID, um, that wasn't able to continue. Um, and we, I was asked in 2021 to see if we could revive the um, value added program during COVID. Um, there was a huge interest in beekeeping during COVID. I think you heard um, from John Caldera yesterday how that kind of exploded. Um, I am a beekeeper. Uh, and a farmer. Uh, our farm, Mundreni Vangi Estate, is in Bua Wain in Wainunu in Vanualevu. Um, I am a not part of a large organization. There was no additional funding that uh, was 
um, put together for these guides. My co-author on the manuals is Annalise Austin. She's from Southern Cross University in Australia, and she had some input into helping me get started with some materials. And she helped me with the editing and a little bit of suggestions around formatting it. So I am going to try to share my screen. Just give me a moment here while I figure that out. So our value-added program, um, the manuals are just uh, a portion of it. And what we started with is understanding what our goals of our program were before we really started working on developing our manuals. And we wanted to um, help beekeepers diversify their a livelihood by diversifying their products. So not just being able to sell honey, but also look at producing good quality wax and products from um, things that bees make. We also wanted to increase participation by, of women in the beekeeping industry. Uh, I think the majority of beekeepers in Fiji are men. Uh, they're the ones that are doing the hard work out in the hives, and oftentimes the women are helping with the harvesting and the processing of wax. There are quite a few other beeke women beekeepers out there doing the hot, sweaty work in the sun too, including myself, but the majority of beekeepers are still men. So we also wanted to ensure that any value-added bee product that we were teaching needed to be of high quality and marketable so that we weren't just teaching beekeepers to just produce um, uh, sort of cottage level types of stuff. We wanted people to actually be able to up their game and be able to get their products into some good, good venues um, by having um, a really presentable high quality product. Okay, next. So for those of you that aren't beekeepers, bees produce a lot of products, not just honey, but wax, propolis, royal jelly, bee venom, and all of these internationally are marketed in various ways. So next. So again, most of you probably know what value adding means, but it basically takes taking a raw product and then turning it into doing something to it to turn it into a new product, generally that new product is shelf stable and higher value. And jam making is a perfect example of a value added. And here overseas, there are a lot of different bee products. There's candles, there's sauces, there's propolis extracts, there's different ways to market the honey that's adding value. Next. In Fiji, Here's some of the examples of products that are on the market right now that are value added, that are fairly high value, like well, high quality, well presented, well marketable. Okay, next. So our value added program of which the manuals are just a part of includes three components, certified instructors, uh, the workshops where we really focus on a lot of practical instruction um, where people can produce, participants can produce um, products and have the manuals to take home as reference guides. The manuals aren't really a standalone, they're part of the product. And the third component was to look at how we could find locally sourced equipment and packaging at affordable prices so that people can produce a good quality product that's going to be marketable. Okay, next. So in January 2022, a little over a year ago, um, Fiji Beekeepers announced that myself and Jean Tikaram from Waitiko Farms in Raki Raki would be the instructors. Uh, we are both beekeepers, and I think it's really important to focus on in this program, it's beekeepers teaching beekeepers, it's farmers teaching farmers, so that transfer of knowledge comes from a knowledge, practical knowledge base. Um, and our workshops are designed around three different workshops. The first one is about wax products, so candles, um, uh, 
producing high quality blocks of wax for sale, um, making uh, wax food wraps. So it's basically wax. The second one is making body care products. And this is the one that most people are really interested in doing. We learn to make um, body balms and um, healing ointments and lip balms. And um, it, it doesn't include lotions because that's a, an advanced technique. And then level three is about honey products. So each workshop is a full day, although sometimes we join two together, two different levels together and do a two-day workshop. Next. So the manuals, which are what's uh, what I've, I've um, submitted for this uh, sharing, are three different manuals, one for each level. Um, I've developed them with the help of Annalise, um, as I said earlier. Each manual is designed to stand alone. However, each manual has uh, a, a chapter on um, sort of the marketing end of what you've made these products, now what do you do with them? And they build manual to manual from some sort of basic product development right up to how do you package them and how do you sell them? So the first one, as, as I said, it's uh, uh, learning how to, to render it. The next one, next. Second one, body care products. And the third one, next, is the honey products. Next. Our workshops have open registration, but we do ask pre-registration. Um, the registration fee is $10, and then we've been paying, asking participants to pay a $10 material fee for the products that they're taking home. Our maximum class size is 12, just to ensure that we have um, uh, a good um, you know, instructor-student ratio that's low enough to make sure that everyone gets personal attention. Um, and each participant is issued with a certificate at the end of the workshop. So offerings to date, we've, um, for level one, we've offered nine workshops, level two, eight. We haven't uh, launched the honey product um, workshop yet, mostly because that manual took a lot longer to develop in terms of testing the products to make sure that they were appropriate for Fiji's hot, humid climate. So we've had a total of 17 days of instruction. We've had 159 participants with 127 of them, 80% of them being women and 32 or 20% being men. Okay, next. So we always have a workshop evaluation and our overall um, score on a 10, five point scale has been really high, 4.9. We've had a lot of positive feedback from participants and it's been really fun to um, uh, do these trainings. Um, it's great to meet people. Um, it's great to see that they're having success and enjoying making it. Um, the availability of supplies and equipment was identified early as a real barrier to entering the value-added marketplace. Um, we did acquire some funding from PIFON to purchase some equipment and supplies. Um, and these supplies, uh, most of them have been candle molds and wick and some different uh, pots for pouring wax. Um, and they were made available as subsidized rate to participants. Um, and packaging, uh, how do you package your product? So in a nice professional way, um, that was a real problem identified in the early uh, phases of this project. Um, I did a, a focus group survey and definitely tin and glass jars were preferred over plastic. And we were really fortunate that a local business started carrying those just at the time we were about to launch our program. So, so some of the lessons and, and actions that we need to take going forward, um, definitely the main lesson I learned is the value of that face-to-face -face knowledge transfer. The books are great. And the books are a really good take-home resource for people, but people learn best from hands-on. Um, so that's my number one takeaway. But aside from that, um, 
going forward with our program, the cost of class materials proved higher than the $10 per person fee. So we will be increasing that in the future. Our manual printing costs, currently Jean and I um, print our manuals in black and white at local printers. And depending on where we are, depends on how much that costs. So it can be quite high. We'd love to be able to get these printed. And we're hoping that um, uh, Annalise's and um, I think it's ACR is, uh, will be printing some of those so that when we have our B Congress in May, we'll have some uh, color printed higher quality manuals available. We do have a high no-show rate for our classes. Um, there's a huge interest in these classes, but because it's pretty inexpensive um, for them, I don't know if participants are as committed to attending. So we do have a high cancellation rate. So it's been recommended um, that we, instead of um, having them um, just pay their pre-registration rate, we need to have them pay their full fee in advance and maybe we'll get a better commitment rate. Um, we'll, we'll try that. Next. Our venue. So Jean and I offer classes at our local farms. And for me, that's a problem because of my remote location. So very few people are able to make it to our farm. So I do most of my training classes away. So I'll go to Lombasa or Lakutu or Suva and I'll sorry. Um, and that means I need to bring everything with me. And I have to have a host that is willing to host it and find a suitable location. And some of those locations have been less than ideal. So going forward, I will provide my workshop sponsors with a, a written list of venue requirements so that hopefully we'll have a better experience in some of those venues. And then, of course, the continuing supply of packaging. Um, our local business um, that did start bringing in some of these products uh, anticipated a higher demand for the um, packaging than has actually happened. Um, so I'm not sure that he's going to be able to continue doing that. So we'll have to approach uh, some of the larger, um, more established businesses to see if they'll be able to bring things in on a more ongoing basis. And as I mentioned, the honey product um, manual, I'm hoping to launch it this April, and I'll be offering that here at Lundrini Dany Estate. Okay, next. So I just wanted to include a few pictures of some of our workshops so that you can see um, probably uh, three quarters of the time at these workshops are hands-on, uh, where they're working through the basic manuals, um, recipes in the manuals. I do focus a lot on, um, while we're making them, talking about how can they personalize these products? What can they do differently? When we're infusing the oils, what, can, what do they have locally that they could infuse their oils with to make their own unique products? Next. So here's some, some more just pictures of some of the, the uh, workshop participants. And you'll see they're all wearing aprons and caps. Um, we try to uh, really focus on hygiene. You're making a lot of um, body care products. You need to make sure that it's high quality, that it's clean, that it meets that standard that we're all after. And I think the, last, the next. So a little bit of a success story. This last week, I was at the Northern Women's Expo in, in Savo Savo, and I met with um, Petty, Petty Lee from Lakutu. And she had entered her body, her body bombs, which is um, a noni beeswax and virgin coconut oil bomb. Um, and she acted as one of the representatives from the North to go through to the National uh, Women's Expo um, happening, I think in June or July in Suva. So she was absolutely thrilled. Her product is so much better than what she was making prior to taking the course. She'd been using a cooked oil and she hadn't been following a recipe. She'd just been sort of been making it by sort of smell and feel. 
and now she's got a consistent high quality product. She brought 20 products with her and she sold them all um, and was super thrilled to go home with that, mm -hmm. uh, the money in her pocket. So I look forward to seeing more stories. I've had other people message me to say that they're making candles and they're making other things. So every time I, I have a past participant uh, email me or, or message me to say they, they've um, done something really cool, it just it's it makes it all worthwhile um, running these these workshops and writing these manuals. So I I just also just want to thank the Fiji Beekeepers Association, a ACR Piffin, and the U.S. Embassy, Embassy sponsored the cost of the workshops in the past year. So thank you very much for um, allowing me to present on our on our project and and I did really enjoy the taking the, the opportunity to make, to write up the manuals. It was a really good learning experience for me, as well as being able to share that knowledge with the people that have attended the workshops. Thank you. Great, thanks Karen. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat for you right now. Uh, maybe towards the end of the session, we'll have some questions, um, but it's great to see how these training guys can be implemented. Um, you know, just a standalone book is not very useful if there's not guidance or actionable use of it. And so seeing how these guys go into these workshops is really helpful. And um, it's actually a good mix of lessons learned mixed in with the training guide. And so uh, very great to hear. Uh, and so transferring now into our fourth cat category of the can fair is those lessons learned case studies. So it's more of these documents that are reflecting on these projects, um, such as workshops like this. And so I just want to highlight some of the submissions we had. So this category was case studies, lessons learned, and impact stories. And so we had over 25 case studies submitted, some of them highlighted here from the Redfruit Institute. We had um, an internal reflection of their program, their mailing list, um, their reach. We had lessons learned from Vanuatu uh, in the spice industry, um, from Island Food Community of Pompeii. We had Micronesian staples. And then we had, additionally, later we'll have Samantha share on this Farming the Pacific Impact Stories, which is a collection of these stories um, from a variety of projects. So I'm excited now to share um, the presentation with Samantha, who's in charge of Island Business. Um, and she has created these impact stories as well as many other publications, bringing awareness to lessons learned in these different projects and um, farming endeavors. So I'd like to hand it off to you, to Samantha. Thanks very much, Ian. I hope you can see and hear me. Can you give me the thumbs up if you can? Yep. Perfect, okay. Um, look, I really want to start by saying it wasn't, this is, I'm representing Island's business, but I'm actually also representing our former publisher, Samasoni Paretti, who um, sadly has moved on to another role now, but he was really the, um, the heart behind this project and the driver of it. So um, while Sami sort of, you know, tapped into the IB resources and uh, team, he, it was really uh, his, his sort of passion project. So Maybe just to start by giving a bit of context about Island's business and what we do. We're a, a regional publication. Um, we're owned by uh, Fijian journalists, but we are uh, distributed regionally and we've been going for about 40 years. Um, we cover agricultural stories a lot. Um, so this was sort of very much aligned with a lot of the work that we've been doing, particularly during, uh, during COVID. Uh, we also produce a, um, we've just started a, a uh, travel and lifestyle publication, which is really looking at travel, at things like agro-tourism. So not the sort of traditional um, tourism offerings, but things like um, Waitika and what they're doing there. And so again, sort of very much in the same um, area of work. And then the third product we have is a, a SME website and resource called Pacific Makete, which again, profiles many of the same sort of people that came through this PIFON publication. So they're all sort of nicely synchronized. Uh, so one thing um, <clears throat> that meant that um, Samasoni was able to really um, 
to, to do this work effectively was that we, at kind of at the beginning of the pandemic, were lucky enough to get a, a Google grant, a Google reporting grant, which they um, offered globally to news organizations that wanted to talk about the impact on the ground of COVID. And so that enabled, this was before obviously the internal um, border closures, but it enabled Samasoni to be able to travel around um, Viti level and Wano level and talk to people about how their lives had changed as a result of COVID. And many of those people were um, former tourism workers that had gone back to their original villages, sometimes for the first time, but you know, for, for many that returned home and sort of got involved in agriculture in a meaningful way for the first time in many years. So that, that I don't know if you can see it, if my camera's working nicely, but this is the, the cover story. Sorry, this is very low tech. I don't have a presentation. <laughs> this was the cover story um, that came out of that. And, and as I said, it had <clears throat> many stories about people and their involvement in agriculture, backyard gardening, which was useful when it came to this, this um, project that he then took on with PIFON and its partners. <clears throat> so clearly by the time this work had started, um, both internal and external borders had closed. So it was all done on Zoom. Um, Sami said it was tremendously useful to have access to the, the project reports um, that Pifon and his partners had produced because that gave the sort of deep context that he needed to be able to do the interviews on Zoom or follow-up interviews by email. Um, he said it was pretty challenging that um, because it was a, a publication with certain sort of um, standards required for um, photography, for example, sort of doing that briefing over the phone or by email was a bit tricky, but I think the end result was, was pretty pleasing. Um, I think also, you know, the, um, I, I mean, Samson is a very experienced journalist, so being able to sort of elicit those stories and get underneath the surface is something that he does or was doing day in, day out. So. Um, when you read the stories, you can really get a sense of both the sort of macro picture, but also some individual stories that come through. And for me, you know, I, I was at the Pacific Agriculture, Agriculture and Forestry Week a couple of weeks ago, and I found it a really useful resource just to go back to that and read those stories before I went to the week, just to sort of get my head into that space again. Um, so I hope that that's, you know, how other people are using it as well. And I, I feel, for us, I feel like it's something that we'll be able to go back to and say, well, actually, how are some of these projects progressing? What has been the longer term impact, um, not just that sort of short to medium term impact? I think the beauty of it, and this is something that we try to try to do at the magazine too, is that it did have a really good regional coverage as well. So, you know, there were stories from Fiji, of course, but also New Caledonia, talking about agroforestry initiatives with uh, young farmers and nutrition in school canteens. Um, there's some great stories from Papua New Guinea around um, digital connectivity and women in agriculture. Uh, from Samoa, there's uh, articles about tea garden initiatives and RPA virtual market. The, the theme of digital connectivity and leveraging it came through, I think, really strongly in many of the stories, as did the power of women to um, make change happen. So that, that was sort of, you know, deliberate or not, it was definitely a sort of undercurrent in many of the stories. Um, you know, from Tonga and Vanuatu, there were also articles, um, again, looking at women in agriculture. So I think, I mean, in terms of distribution, we, so the, the publication was produced. We also ran the articles as standalone pieces in Islands Business and on our website. And then we also shared them with PAC News, which is a regional uh, news service, which means that they go to all the, um, it goes to a very large number of Pacific Islands news outlets, both print and, and digital and radio. So it meant that the, they could turn those stories, they could either find their own local angle to them or they could just reproduce the stories as they were, they were um, produced. So, um, you know, in terms of distribution, I think that meant that it, probably got fairly wide coverage at a time when it was really hard to do regional coverage as well because of you know, our inability to travel. I think I'll leave it there, but um, you know, it was, it was a real privilege for IB to work on this project. And it's really, um, I think, 
during COVID, you know, that whole, that sense of resilience and, and people, you know, understanding that we're losing it came through really strongly. And this, the stories that we shared through this publication were a real testament to that. And the, the power of working uh, in organizations as well and sharing knowledge and, and sharing expertise, which is what I know a lot of the discussions over the last couple of days have been. Nakawalu, thank you very much. Thanks, Samantha. Yeah, it's a pretty unique publication in the time that it was made uh, and was able to be accomplished with it. And I think it's a great example of these lessons learned, case studies, and impact stories that this was mainly these impact stories. Uh, it's the energy behind the movement and how we're wanting to highlight the importance of rural farming and our farmers. And so these stories, having them in a document that can be referred to, and like you said, how you reflected on that before uh, the big event, in Nandi last week or a couple of weeks ago. It's great to have these resources. So thank you for sharing about that. Thank I'd like you. to now introduce Adelina Lawrence, um, head of the Island Food Community of Pompeii. And I'll hand it over to you, Adelina. Oh, it looks like you're still on mute, Adelina. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. And yeah, hello everybody. Uh, well, I think I will just go straight into it. Uh, uh, I will talk from my chicken scratch note. Uh, yeah, uh, the island food go local. Establish a email network. Efficient to promote island food for their health. Biodiversity and other chief benefits. Thanks to Almighty God for the gift of soil, ocean, water, crops, people animals and fishes to the small island on Bay. On behalf of the island food community of On Bay, IFCP, I shall ask for a moment of prayer for the good souls of the remarkable citizens departed to their internal trust. Without them, I cannot be speaking to the amazing audience today. The late Dr. Lois Goldberger, the founding IFCP researcher, executive director, and remarkable disease person represent the entire island democracy. And a big thank you to be on Truman Miro, distinguished members. Dr. Kyle and your very able staff. Be born family, members and supporters around the globe, especially those of you who are in the audience. And likewise, the other people who are not with us due to conflicting time. 
Thanks, everyone. The core of Island Food Resolve. First, culture. Culture play a active control in sustaining the diversity of Pompeii food crops. Preference, yams, bananas, taros, coconuts, Egyptian perennial, and our crops, both native and indigenous. Culture tradition is a strong force to push increased production as well as upkeeping physical fitness and happy community life of the UN population. Health. And then seeing promoting of nutritionally healthy food. The yellow fridays can assist control, prevent the alarming rate of NCD. We faced in one day. The call of cheap benefits is indeed a way forward to stop the escalating NCD challenges. Therefore, a united effort is crucial to developing a strategy for a timely implementation. SED is a main killer. And many are surviving weaker victims of this catastrophic illness. environment only is blessed with high rainfall, 200 inches annually. An ideal environment condition suitable for plants growth. The green last vegetation covering the mountainous topography stand out. Economic. There is no disable availability of produce and products in the domestic market and potential export product development for the selected niche products. To the iron food demand of my credit families now living abroad in Guam Hawaii and the US mainland. Food security, grow your own food, period. 
and need to be promoted at all levels. The email network, as it may sound primitive, however, the song shows very useful. Over 600 registered participants and countless number of the dog. government and community-based organizations. Every time I go on Facebook, State, College of Micronies have some extension. Micronies Conservation Trust, Green Climate Funds, ISCP, Bone Bay Farmers Association, the Regional Development Partners, SPC, B Fund, Alliance Fires of Diversity, are really demand. There is a school garden proposal in the pipeline to greatly benefit the youth, parents, families, civil societies, leaders, the entire community. Let's go lower. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Adelina. I think the email case study is a great example for that chief program um, on how you're able to reach a lot of people all through FSM um, on that program through email. And it's a really good example of keeping it simple. You know, all these social media tools we have, it's all for targeted audiences. And so it's what works best where you are with your community. And it's, yeah, a great example of seeing how email was so successful for that chief program. But thank you for sharing. Yeah. So the next section in our program, we wanted to highlight all the resources we had um, for the competition aspect of the can fair. As I had mentioned, we had had um, over 150 total resources submitted. Um, so for our competition, we had the guidelines um, posted for any submissions. And so looking at that, um, more guidelines on that judging is in that document that's sent out on the registration form. But we had three judges. We had Kyle Stice, director of PFON, Ko Ming Wei, who shared this morning our keynote, um, director for Center for Getting Things Started, and then my behalf or myself on behalf of the Can Fair Committee. Uh, and so, out of these 150 resources, we looked at all of them and together um, assigned scores and basically narrowed it down to our finalists. And so, what we were looking at is what we've discussed today on the information that's in a resource, the design, and then is it usable? What are the actionable items? How easy is it to be applied by the farmers and be a, a useful resource for them? So happy to share these results. And third place for our farmer training guide, it's the Fiji Breadfruit Manual uh, submitted and uh, produced by Nature's Way Cooperative. And so congratulations to them. This manual had a lot of guides from um, propagation techniques to production and post-harvest handling and also value added um, added to these breadfruit products in the form of breadfruit flour and different varieties that work for that. So we wanna congratulate Nature's Way Cooperative. And for second place, um, when Renan Kagi Estate, uh, we saw from Karen sharing earlier, 
just the value of how well this um, manual is able to be incorporated into workshops. And that's a great example of um, how it's not a standalone document. It usually needs some type of incorporation to really reach the most people and have the biggest impact. And so producing value added DGD products, uh, that part one of three parts and looking forward to that fourth part coming out on Honey that you mentioned, Karen. So congratulations. And oh, go ahead, Karen. Yeah, thank you very much. I enjoyed making them. Thank you. And for first place, um, Kiko Tiga Fiji that submitted this sustainable agroforest cropping systems. And so this was one module that uh, PFON also helped um, work on to share, but it's one module out of seven. And so these modules had a lot of detail on um, actionable steps for this agroforestry cropping system, some of the module, modules related to breadfruit and agroforestry systems. It was just a really well produced um, uh, training guide. I want to crack, uh, congratulate Kiko Siga on that. Moving on to our case studies, lessons learned uh, for third place, Island Food Community of Pompeii. Thank you, Adelino, for uh, producing this. It's a great example as we just covered um, how it supported the Go Local Island Food Network and that CHIEF program on basically reaching as many people as possible um, in an efficient way. Congratulations. Uh, and then in second place, we had the Vanuatu Spices Network, Lessons Learned. Uh, and so this was a combination of a lot of stories, um, impact stories of different projects that have been conducted. Uh, you can see in the title is over 20 years. And so there's a lot of good information on um, moving forward in that industry for farmers to look back at and learn from. So congratulations to Farm Support Association in Vanuatu. And first place we hear from today, thank you Island Business um, for farming the Pacific impact stories. As we discussed having this um, source of stories to look back on, it's a great source of motivation as well as uh, highlights these farmers and what's actually going on that we can further support rural farming in the Pacific. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you so much. And yeah, obviously want to acknowledge Sony Sony who can't be with us today that put a lot of work into bringing these impact stories together. Yes, absolutely. So now I want to hand it off back to Ilya. Thank you, Ian. Well, if there's no questions uh, coming in from our audience, um, we will wrap up the uh, webinar. And so in saying that, we want to say thank you for uh, attending today and helping uh, make our first KM Fair a success. Uh, Father Isaiah for opening, for opening the event with a prayer, as well as our panelists for sharing their insights and expertise, combing way, uh, Karen Mills, Samantha Magic, Adelina Lorenz, and Angela Birch for wrapping up our 2023 Pacific Agriculture Knowledge Management Fair on a high. We'd also like to thank all those who uh, submitted resources and projects for the showcase, which added a lot of value to the event. We'd also like to congratulate the winners of the video competition and um, um, the showcase studies, as well as the farmer training guides and everyone who participated. Good morning and thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.